Hello everyone, welcome to the broadcast. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes here. Okay, I think that's enough time to uh, to wait for everyone to join. Uh, of course, uh, the fire alarm just went off at our hospital here, so there might be a little background noise, but I'm going to talk through that and hopefully it subsides in the sake of time. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the second installment of the COVID-19 webinar series hosted by the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force. The task force is made up of representatives volunteering their time and knowledge from the American Society of Extracorporeal Technology, the American Board of Cardi Cardiovascular Perfusion, the American Academy of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the Latin American Perfusion Association, the Australian and New Zealand College of Perfusionists, the Canadian Society of Clinical Perfusion, Comprehensive Care Services, Specialty Care, the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons, Perfusion.com, and Vivacity Perfusion. Next, please. Now, I am Justin Sleesman. I'm a perfusionist at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital in Palo Alto, California. I'm the co-moderator for this webinar, joined by Renee Axworth Dickey, from Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, in this webinar, we're gonna hear from three speakers. First off, we're gonna have Tom Chancy, Vice President of Pediatrics and ECLS at Comprehensive Care Services. And Tom is gonna focus on maintaining the state of readiness for COVID-19 in the hospital setting, specifically CCP safety in the operating room and the ICUs. And I think this is a true reflection of kind of where uh, a lot of people are currently at that they might have some COVID patients in their hospital where they haven't escalated care onto ECLS support or ECMO support. Um, but we're in a state of readiness and maintaining that readiness. Secondly, we'll have Amy Ging, who is a Director of Perfusion Services at Inova Fairfax Hospital in Fall, for, Fall Church, Virginia. And Amy will be sharing lessons learned from a high volume ECLS center utilizing ECMO for COVID-19 and sharing her experiences and some success of the patients that she has seen. Lastly, we'll have Al Stammers, Vice President, Clinical Quality and Outcomes Research for Specialty Care, who resides in Sweet Valley, Pennsylvania. And Al's gonna dig a little bit deeper and do an examination of the unique trends and data in COVID-19 patients on ECLS uh, using his colleagues uh, registry and network that they have available at Specialty Care. The panelists that will be joining us for the Q&A session at the end is Courtney Peterson uh, and share her experiences as she's the area, cl area clinical manager in the greater Denver area. Next, please. 
We'll be recording today's broadcast to allow for future playback and after presentations from these three, we will have a question and answer session. Feel, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Know that they're at the bottom there with a green arrow. Uh, to submit any questions you may have during the presentation and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible during this session at the end. Next, please. If we're unable to answer your questions uh, during that Q&A session, make sure that you can uh, respond to, uh, make sure that you know that you can uh, post your questions on the discussion forum at the website below, the jointperfusiontaskforce.org website that you see listed below. With that said, I will now pass off to my co-moderator, Renee Dickey. Hey, Renee, you're on mute still. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, we're excited to announce that the ABCP webinar has been approved for 1.2 Category 1 CEUs. Thank you to the board for the quick response on that. And we'll get right into it with Tom Clancy talking about readiness for COVID-19. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Well, hello, my name is Tom Chancey. I have no disclosures other than I work for Comprehensive Care Services, which is a national perfusion company. I appreciate the opportunity AMSEC has given me to briefly speak with you guys today. Next slide. So although we're a national perfusion company, we are just now beginning to experience the surge of patients within our healthcare facilities. Today, we currently have 13 ECMO patients um, on or are recently supported within our hospital system. 12 of which have been DV, one has been supported VA. And then as you see here, so far, three of four have been successfully weaned. Um, the average age is 42, which is, is somewhat similar to what ELSA is reporting. And then you look at the PF ratio, the PA to FIOT ratio, we're averaging about 78. Again, it's kind of similar to what's being reported from ELSA. Some of the commonalities include hypertension, diabetes, and the lives, um, excuse me, um, obesity and diabetes. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons we've learned today, um, these patients often present extremely hypoxic to the hospitals, often saturating in the 50s. In fact, one such gentleman presented with shoulder injury, didn't know he was hypoxic, and when they hooked up the saturation, they were quite surprised to see that he had a sat of 52. So these patients can deteriorate extremely rapid. Um, other, of our patients, long recruitment maneuvers were all utilized. Uh, again, I told you about the average PF ratio of 78. Also what's interesting is, is several of these patients, well actually the majority of these patients present with some form of kidney injury requiring CRT. Um, because of this is a novel virus and because it is so highly contagious, it brings with it three complications for the healthcare system. How do we effectively treat so many unknown variables related to the etiology of the virus? How do we prepare for the high surge of patients to our hospitals? And third, how do we properly protect our healthcare workers from a virus that is again so contagious? What we've learned in just their limited experiences, many of the hospitals simply aren't prepared. In fact, some hospitals still have same day elective um, urgent cases. So it's definitely, um, as these patients present to the hospitals, it will quickly have to change. Next slide, please. So part of the um, considerations for ECLS readiness is, you know, some of the obvious is accessible resources to include ECMO equipment. What are the available consoles and clamps, oxygen air holders, even the pressure cables and some ancillary components? Um, what about the supply card? Do you have a su supply card that could be designated for the COVID unit? Maybe consider creating a checklist necessary for components um, for ECMO initiation. Looking at the supplies and what available ECMO packs do you have? We've all been challenged with oxygen generators. So what is the availability of oxygen generators? Even look at your availability of centrifugal pumps. And then cannulas, you have the proper size cannulas that will, will be ideal for these patients. What is the staffing model uh, that will be considered? So some of the considerations we have is um, staffing special, one specialist per ECMO unit, but will these rotations be 12 hour shifts, eight hour shifts? Some of the concern is these can be long shifts and can provide, can prove to be quite challenging, especially when um, you're required to wear full PPE protection through the entirety of the shift. Perfusion staff, ECMO specialists, and bedside RNs often report a fear of breaking the PPE protection to eat, to drink, or even use the restroom. So therefore, perhaps incorporate shorter rotations such as AR shifts, you know, per available resources. 
I highly advocate for your perfusion staff and ancillary staff is to research COVID-19, increase you, you and your team's knowledge base regarding disease manifestations, uh, have a good understanding of the viral rate of transmission, especially as it relates to dormancy, um, such as plastic, dormancy on metal, cardboard, and even aerosols. What are the signs and symptoms? And I think it's highly incumbent upon us to understand the disease, the progression of the disease. Next slide. Some other considerations is within your hospital, create a plan. First and foremost, start with establishing a level of communication with your physician and other management team members. What might be the inclusion and exclusion criteria for ECMO activation? Oftentimes this may be staged as resource capacity fluxes, but what will be that plan? What might be the location for ECMO initiation? Um, it is ICU setting may be advantageous in order to avoid unnecessary transporting. Discuss ECMO modality and ideal cannulation methods, especially for respiratory failure, BV support via the right femoral vein uh, and IJ, or less than right femoral BV is preferred. Both afford increase in flows while negating additional equ equipment and staffing exposure, often required for dual lumen cannula placement. Avoid transporting if at if all possible. Establish a level of expectation regarding potential ECMO intervention, such as eCPR or ECMO circuit failure. What will be the expectation should emergent um, intervention be necessary? Also discuss anticoagulation strategy and monitoring guidances. These patients can be very hypercoagulable with increased risk of, of circuit thrombosis, especially with limited oxygen availability. Know your resources and have that um, level of understanding and, and um, a plan of action. Consider establishing a tiered level of potential ECMO readiness to avoid emergent activation procedures to help reduce exposure to the healthcare team. If possible, plan ahead to place these patients on ECMO early before they end up crashing. Next slide. In regards to your CERC, establishing monitoring guidelines, minimize exposure as much as necessary. Some considerations would include incorporate simultaneous pre and post pressure monitoring for oxygenated performance assessment as you compare that to the patient blood gases. Consider elimination of pressure domes and replace with pressure transducers. Also consider continuous heparin flush through the transducer in order to maintain patency through both um, pressure ports. You can utilize the IV pump at a two to one ratio of 500 units of heparin to one liter of normal saline. And you can run it through the IV pump maybe at one cc an hour or utilize a pressure bag. And I'd say set the pressure by about 75 millimeters of mercury above your pre oxygen pressure. Um, eliminate any venous access ports on the ECMO drainage line, pre-centrifugal pump. This would include negative pressure monitoring, pigtails for IV, blood component infusion, and or sampling. If access port is required, recommend having a port connection between centrifugal pump and inlet of oxygen generator. Um, determine what, what's gonna be the frequency of circuit assessments. Will you, again, trying to keep the minimum to um, exposure to the room, will it be Q change or will it be Q8? Identify pressure alarm settings and your alarm perimeter. Consider standardizing these limits to avoid broad, too broad of parameter standings. Also, verify your alarm volume is loud enough to hear. Um, for cardio health um, users, consider not utilizing alarm intervention of the bubble sensor. Consider only alert mode only. Instead, set alarm intervention on the venous pressure monitoring, perhaps setting a high negative pressure minus 20 above the current pressure volume. Any slide, please? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go back. I missed it. So, and then since many of the ECMO auctioneer manufacturers cannot definitively rule out theoretical possibility of viral migration from the blood phase to the gas phase of the PMP auctioneers, and it is known limitation of microporous membrane auctioneers that blood plasma could leak through the membrane fibers, again, from the blood phase to the gas phase, consider scavenging of the exhaled gases from the auctioneer outlet for both PMP and hollow fiber auctioneers. More specifically, def definitively in the OI, I, I would highly suggest qualifying oxygen generator scavenging. Next slide. Safety first. These patients all present with some very unique challenges, so safety is imperative. Estimated 10 to 15% of healthcare workers do test positive for COVID-19, so proper PPE is the number one priority. Become proficient with PPE protection, donning and doffing. Practice so it can be performed quickly but safely. Considering incorporating a skills competency to ensure a provable level of proficiency. Then pass that knowledge on to your coworkers. Practice having a spotter to determine the safeness of donning and when doffing. Always remember to perform hand hygiene. 
cannot emphasize that enough. Consider wearing gloves and masks at all times. I know it seems a little extreme, but healthcare workers can be some of the highest vectors within the hospital. They unknowingly can be exposed to patients and or other practitioners who may come in contact and could be carrier of the virus. So we often touch our face, they say 23 times an hour. So having the gloves kind of, sometimes it's almost a mindset to not touch your face. If possible, remain out of the room during aerosolized procedures. And then a resource perfusion, like most specialists or RN is essential. Someone who can actively watch the dying and doffing of team members as they enter and exit the room. Next slide. Ways to minimize in-room exposure. What tools can aid in enhancing patient monitoring in the room? Communication and safety is imperative. So can in, have in-room cameras directed towards the patient, hemodynamic monitoring, and ECMO console? What about two-way radio or telecom system within the room? Wipeable markers or eraser to write on the door for visibility, such as lab parameters and settings, or direct communication between, you know, in and out of the room. Can the IV pumps or the ventilator controller be monitored outside? Can the CRT machine also be controlled from outside the patient's room? What about remote monitoring for ECMO console? I.e., based on the room size, can the console be stretched safely to extend outside the room? An example of Centromag and a Novolon console table is 10 feet, so some ICU doors will still close and maintain that negative pressure seal. If not an option, consider extending circuit lines to be further away from the patient. Also, utilizing remote monitoring such as Talus Clinical's new handheld ACG ECMO monitoring tool can be very advantageous. But all of these are ways to utilize methods to minimize room exp exposure. Also, create a level of partnership with the bedside RN. Teamwork can often prevail in times of crisis. The RNs are often more than willing to help. So open, I suggest have an open dialogue with your bedside RN. Um, I would suggest review the circuit with them at the beginning of the shift so they know what to look for and can tell, call your attention to any potential changes. Identify clamping landmarks, such as incorporating color taping on the ECMO circuit, drainage, and return lines. In the event of an ECMO emergency, the color tape will help act as a reference guide where to clamp on both the drainage and return line. And then finally, next slide. For an astronaut, panic is suicide. Practice for every potential variable over and over. Adapt out of fear with familiarity in order to overcome each crisis and control vigilance. So before I close, it cannot be understated that proper PPE is the most important thing you can do for your safety of yourself and for those around you. Please be diligent about the PPE and infection prevention strategies you employ. Perfusions are not typically well versed in donning and doffing procedures for PPE. Practice these procedures. Be the person setting the example of what you do and then how to do it well. Be the astronaut. Be prepared. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for that presentation, Tom. Um, I'd just like to say to everyone, if anybody has a master checklist they feel like they could post on the discussion forum to share with everyone, that would be really great. Um, next up, we have Amy Ging from Inova Fairfax Falls Church, and she's going to talk about her lessons learned in her high volume ECMO center. Thanks. Hi, Amy, I think you're on mute. All right, perfect. Can you go to the next slide, please? All right, um, like Renee said, my name is Amy and I work at Inova Fairfax Hospital. Um, I just wanted to show this slide briefly um, just to give you an idea of um, the current COVID volume um, in my area. So um, when you look at the map, um, Northern Virginia is where Inova is situated. Um, so kind of basically where all the COVID patients are uh, on this map, um, that kind of Northern dark blue tip. Um, so part of the reason that we've been able to allocate all these resources to ECMO is just that we don't have as many patients as some of the other areas currently. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a dashboard that we've been using as an institution. Um, we've been following it during our, um, our planning meetings, um, and it's really been helpful in identifying, um, you know, what our projected resources resources are going to be um, and also um, what resources we, we may need based on um, uh, when our peak volume is going to hit and then also current patient volume um, in the area. Next slide please. All right, and this is um, what our institutional volume is. Um, as of yesterday around 5 p.m. I got this update. Um, so we as a system have approximately 150 patients that are hospitalized um, with uh, COVID. 
So about 60 of those are vented. Um, we're up to seven ECMOs, um, currently with five on, two, um, two have been weaned. So um, again, not super um, high COVID uh, volume like some of the other centers um, that you've seen, but still a fair amount. Next slide, please. So a lot of work and planning took place uh, to prepare us for our COVID ECMOs. Um, I just wanted to share a few of the um, early discussion points. I think um, you know, Tom already talked about a few of those, um, but so I'll skip over those. But um, um, so uh, we had to figure out um, you know, where we were going to cannulate these patients. Were we going to cannulate them in the unit that um, they were currently being cared for? Were we going and then transport them across the hospital? Um, were we going to cannulate them and care for them in those units? Um, and then um, another big point that we had to talk about was getting team member um, security access to all of those units. Um, we have five different buildings, um, so as you can imagine, getting access for all those different places is, uh, can be quite challenging. Um, so we had to work all that out before we could even think about putting our first patient on. Um, and then we had to come to an agreement with our surgeons and our uh, intensivists and ECMO specialists um, and nursing team on a cannulation strategy and um, uh, what approach that was going to be, um, what type of cannulas they wanted to use, wires, um, uh, dilator kits, um, uh, other ECMO supplies um, and nursing supplies so that we could get carts together to actually put um, those up in the units that we were going to cannulate in. Um, um, the, the third is probably the most important point um, on this slide, which is to have a pre-procedure -proce pre safety huddle um, before entering the patient room, before we, um, you know, don any of our PPE. Um, we meet as a group with, like I said, the intensivist, surgeon, perfusionist, ECMO specialist, um, and then also our nursing team um, to go over any, um, any potential changes to what our initial plan was, um, pull all of our disposable equipment, uh, make sure that we have everything available um, to take into the room, um, and then also have a second set of uh, disposables um, right outside the room. Our goal is that once we enter that patient room, um, we don't want to exit until um, that patient is, um, is stable and on ECMO. Um, and then the fourth point was um, talking about where we're actually going to get our PPE from. Um, so since we're in a different unit, um, we wanted to make sure that um, there was a clear plan as to how we were going to get our N95 masks and our hats and our gowns and all of that kind of stuff. Next slide, please. So the cannulation plan that we um, decided on was Fem Fem VV ECMO. So um, we're using a 25 French uh, femoral venous cannula as our drainage in the left femoral vein. Um, and then for our reinfusion cannula, we're using a long single stage um, biomedicus venous, can venous cannula. Um, it's placed into the right femoral vein. Um, we advance it uh, far enough so that the tip is basically at the level of the right atrium. If for some reason um, we're not able to cannulate uh, fem fem, our um, second option would be uh, fem IJ uh, VV ECMO. So we have cannulas um, up in the unit for that. Um, we do actually have the ability to uh, provide some cardiac support should a patient need it, either expected or unexpectedly. Um, so far to date, we haven't um, we haven't had to had to go that route. Um, just of note, part of the reason why we didn't go with um, using like a crescent or an avalon cannula was we don't have um, fluoro capability up in those units. Um, so we're really only using a TEE. And also our um, physicians really didn't want to be working kind of around the neck um, and the, the face area. So um, that's some of the rationale for why we chose going, uh, why we chose to go the fem fem route. Um, Currently, all of our patients are being kept in negative pressure rooms, um, all in non-cardiac ICUs. We're trying to cohort all of those patients in the uh, non-heart and vascular building uh, to start. Um, and then once those units were uh, to get full, we'd, um, we would potentially have some of those patients come over to the heart and vascular building. And um, as Tom mentioned, um, communication through the negative pressure room is, is key. Um, uh, most of our negative pressure rooms actually have an ante room outside of them. And so it's quite difficult to, uh, to communicate if you're in the room. Um, also with PAPRs, for any of you who haven't worn them, it's really difficult to hear through those. Um, so we actually uh, uh, started using walkie talkies to communicate uh, inside and outside of, outside of the room. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here's just um, some loose guidelines that we've been following to determine candidacy for ECMO. I think they're pretty close to what um, ELSO has out right now. Um, but uh, our average um, patient age is 43 years, so pretty young um, cohort of patients, um, relatively healthy otherwise, no real comorbidities. Um, PF ratio is pretty much all less than um, 150. Um, all patients before ECMO had multiple, um, multiple um, uh, proning that occurred. Um, and then for vent time, um, all the patients were, um, 
were on mechanical ventilation for less than seven days before ECMO. And I actually kind of anecdotally feel like um, if we approach that seven day mark and patients are marginal, um, we would probably opt to put them on and, and give them a shot as opposed to wait 10 days and then they're no longer considered um, a candidate for ECMO. Next slide, please. Um, so here's a, a brief overview of our seven patients that we've done so far. Um, I think um, what stands out to me most on the slide is just the difficulty with anticoagulation. Um, it's been variable patient to patient. Um, we've converted about half of our patients from heparin to bivalirudin. Um, depending on the patient and also on the intensives it's taken care of uh, our patients, the PTT goal is fluctuating quite a bit. Um, so it's, it's been uh, just a real challenge for us. Um, uh, we have um, had to do, do a couple of circuit change outs. So uh, patient number two, we actually, uh, he's on his second, or he's on his third um, ECMO circuit. Um, we changed out uh, one additional circuit on another patient. And then just of note, we, um, patient number six, we actually had to extract some clot from one of our cannulas uh, upon initiation. Our, our surgeons are pretty, pretty quick at cannulating. So um, it, it's quite interesting that there was a significant amount of clot after giving uh, 50 units uh, per kilo of heparin. Um, so after this, we decided we were gonna start giving 100 units per kilo of heparin for initiation. Um, next slide, please. Some information that I um, was able to get from our um, uh, group of intensivists yesterday. We are, um, we are doing CRT on all of our patients. This is the filter that they're using in HF1000. Um, that's, um, and then they are looking into trying to um, um, uh, request um, the cytosore filters and then also looking at plasma convalescence currently, but um, haven't started doing that yet. Next slide, please. And then this is just a, kind of a busy slide, but on a more broad level, I just think this is something that's um, really helped us. Um, we receive communication from our um, very high level administration. Um, and I think we're lucky to have this, but it's uh, just this clear and consistent communication that's really helped kind of maintain a sense of calm around the hospital. Um, it helps, I think all of us feel prepared. Um, and also kind of gives us a sense of kind of connectiveness across, you know, the different units and departments throughout the hospital. Um, and I think has really helped us um, with our kind of success with caring for these patients so far. Um, the perfusion and ECMO teams are pretty much in constant communication um, with regard to ECMO uh, disposables, um, ECMO pump location. I just put up um, kind of two uh, little screenshots of some of the communication that we do twice a day. Um, again, it helps us keep track of uh, where our ECMO pumps are, how many we have, um, and I, it's, it's definitely a very necessary thing. Um, the hospital has been um, very aggressive with converting to negative pressure rooms. We're converting at a rate of five per day um, in anticipation that we, we may end up uh, with a surge at some point. So, so far we have three units that are already converted and we're still, we're still converting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are cohorting our COVID uh, positive patients currently in a non-heart uh, uh, non -heart and vascular building. Um, we have three uh, non-cardiac ICUs that we're gonna go through first and then we'll use our cardiac ICUs after. There is some discussion about um, creating an emergency field hospital with the help of FEMA. Um, should we um, fill up our, our current hospital? So that's in discussion. And then I can't stress enough the importance of education. Um, again, there's just a little screen capture of one of the uh, education projects that my team's been working on to help educate um, nurses and um, respiratory therapists and other staff who aren't uh, familiar with ECMO. So we just have these laminated cards that, um, that you know, we can use to help train people. Um, as Tom said, PPE training's critical, um, you know, and, and donning and doffing PPE for the OR and for the ICU, the process is different. Um, so uh, you should definitely make sure that you're practicing both. Um, department uh, cross-training and education, again, is super important. Um, we've been watching videos and uh, attending webinars for operating vents for um, CRT. Um, oddly enough, something I never thought I would uh, I'd have to watch a video on is how to put a foley in um, as a perfusionist, but believe it or not, we are actually doing that at this point. So um, just to be prepared in case of a surge. And then our hospital, I think next week, we'll be um, distributing uh, some uh, personal PPE bags for um, every team member to um, um, store if we're all going to get hard hats, face shields, um, uh, we'll get another N95, um, just a whole bunch of different supplies that will help us um, so we can just grab it and go if we need to take care of one of these patients. Next slide please. 
And I just wanted to finish up um, with these um, two pictures. So on the right, this is the outside of one of our relatively new buildings. It's about four years old. And you can see all the little white kind of uh, uh, squares or rectangles. Um, those are all rooms, patient rooms that have been converted in the last two weeks over to negative pressure rooms. And uh, my team loves it every day we, uh, as we come and go. Um, we see a couple more of these pop up and um, it's just nice to see that the hospital is putting in these um, kind of protective measures for, for us. And then the picture on the left is actually our ICU room. Um, so on the left of that picture, you can see um, our CRRT machine, our ECMO pump. Um, you can see all of our equipment is in the room. We're not keeping any equipment out um, of the uh, patient room and that's just due to how um, the uh, rooms in this OR are set up. And then next slide, please. And I just want to say thanks so much for everyone who's participating in the webinar. Um, I know everyone's really busy um, right now, so it's, it's nice to get on and kind of feel a sense of community amongst the uh, uh, perfusionists across the country and um, parts of the mm -hmm. world. Um, I, I, just put my, um, I just put my email up there in case anyone has any questions or um, any um, maybe suggestions, things that you think, oh, I didn't hear you talk about this, um, that maybe you know, we could, I could take back to INOVA and help care for our patients. And I will turn it back over to Kate. Thank you for that fun, really great presentation. Um, next we have Sam Ers, um, Vice President of Clinical Quality and Outcomes Research at Specialty Care. And he's presenting from Sweet Valley, Pennsylvania, sheltering in place. And he's gonna talk about unique trends and data in the COVID-19 population they've had at Specialty Care. Thanks, Al. Uh, thank you, Renee. Thank you, Justin. Uh, it is a, in a pleasure to participate uh, on today's panel and to listen to Tom and, and Amy. Very interesting uh, data. Uh, I just want to state one thing before we get into the, the slides. Um, in the history of uh, perfusion, this is the first time since the mid-60s when um, all of us have come together in a com commonality. Uh, never before had that occurred other than when we didn't have multiple organizations. So I, I just want to recognize the AMSAC Safety Committee, uh, the Board of Directors, Executive Committee, and, and all the leadership and all the organizations on the slide here for realizing the importance of this. It's unprecedented and it's great to have everybody all together. Uh, may I have my first slide, Kate? Um, what we had done is put together a database when uh, we first realized that uh, the use of uh, ECMO might morph into something uh, quite significant. And what I'd like to do for the next nine or 10 minutes is just to go over um, what we've been able to accumulate within that database. Um, on the left-hand side, we have some data. We have uh, 32 patients that we've supported to date at nine different hospitals. Uh, the primary reason for support is ARDS, secondary being pneumonia. And 97% of all of these patients have tested positive before going on ECMO, and the one that was put on ECMO tested positive after. Uh, the distribution of ethnicity is shown on the bottom. Uh, the primary group are Caucasians, making up 45%, and then almost an equal number of African Americans and Hispanic to meet the Caucasians. On the right-hand side, we see the nine different hospitals and the frequency of which ECMO is being done at each one of these centers. Interestingly, our busiest centers doing over 100 ECMOs per year are not even uh, represented or, rare, or rarely represented on this particular list. It's actually smaller centers that have, uh, have, have jumped into that 10 and seven category. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, there it goes, thank you. Um, some more summary data on the left-hand side, 70% of ECMO patients that we have are, are male. The average age is 51%, the range is 19 to 76. The distribution of devices that are used, primarily cardio help, followed closely by the Rotaflow and QD, um, the Quadrex. Uh, the cannulas used, uh, they're uh, a match of, um, a, mis uh, a matched group, usually Medtronic and Edwards, and uh, I apologize, uh, let me just turn this off. Thank you. Um, sorry guys, please forgive me. Um, the crescent can can cannulas use the most of the single uh, vessel cannulas with Avalon and 11%. Uh, heparin is the primary anticoagulant that is used with uh, DTIs, Argatroban, and, and uh, under 10%. On the right-hand side, as we heard earlier, we see that the individuals that are being put on are primarily veno venous and, uh, and lesser degrees um, shown there. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, 
Um, if you look at three-day blocks of what's occurring in regards to the, the, the uh, uh, patients being placed on ECMO, we see that um, going back to March 17th when our first patient was placed, uh, once we hit the end of March and in April, there seems to be a, uh, an upward slope, a trajectory that's showing more and more patients. And the next slide groups that same data by weeks. And uh, Kate, you can go ahead and advance, please. And here, the most recent week's data, we see that we are on a upward trajectory. I, I don't believe anybody believes that we are plateaued uh, at this particular point. And, uh, and we're averaging now three to four ECMOs being put on per day. Next slide, please. Um, this shows the time from when the initial diagnosis occurred until the time of ventilator use, and then the time from ventilator use onto ECMO. And I think this is important as individuals are planning what, uh, when they have one of these patients who is an extremist, to, uh, to plan for what could occur to be a, an ECMO run. So we see that 1.8, almost two days with a wide standard deviation is the time from diagnosis to vent and then about four days from the time of the ventilator use to the time period that they were placed on ECMO. So that enables individuals to, as Amy had pointed out, to assemble the resources and get the team ready if the patient doesn't seem to be doing better with other maneuvers being performed. Next slide. Um, some of the data now we're going to work on to is the difference between survivors and non-survivors. Uh, on the right-hand side, the green bar graph shows what's currently being done. We have 17 patients on ECMO right now. And on the left-hand side is a, uh, the group of 15 patients that have been weaned to date. So we're going to go into that a little bit uh, in greater detail. We actually have 10 that have not survived and five that have. Next slide. Uh, the survivors make up about 33% of the individuals who've been taken off ECMO so far, which is, is pretty similar and consistent to what any of the published reports that we're seeing are showing. Obviously, there's a lot of variability here. These patients are, are quite diverse in their presentations, so it's uh, without any type of randomization, it's hard to say whether these are good, bad, or indifferent statistics. It's all descriptive at this particular point. Next slide. Um, the next three um, graphs are box plots that show um, time on ECMO as well as age. The first one on the vertical axis shows the days. The, uh, the, the uh, dark black bar is the median time on ECMO. And then each one of the dots that are in these, um, uh, these particular um, bar graphs show the uh, individual patients. Thank you, Kate. And, uh, and then the first and third quartiles, uh, as far as the um, range of uh, performance. The left-hand side of the horizontal axis will show our non-survivors and the right-hand side are survivors. So the first thing we see that survivors are actually on ECMO almost two days longer than those who have not survived. Next slide, please. Um, hours on ECMO, again, a similar trend. Individuals are on ECMO who are surviving at about 180 hours as opposed to uh, slightly under 150 for the non-survivors. And in the last uh, box plot here, we'll see the age. Please go ahead, Kate. And a little bit older age that, we, that, uh, that Amy had presented on, their survivors are younger um, than the individuals who uh, were not able to be weaned off of ECMO or died within the first day of ECMO. Um, so we, we, we understand, and others have reported this too, the, that age is a, is a factor with uh, affecting overall survivability. Next slide. Uh, here's some more data, which I think is, is useful. Um, uh, the ages are shown at the very top. Uh, we haven't performed statistical analysis on these. It's uh, a small sample size, and it's, uh, it's a diff difficult uh, to perform that particular analysis and have it of any meaning. But what we see in the non-survivors, almost twice as much of those were men as opposed to women. Um, no difference with ethnicity in regards to um, survivability. We've all heard that African Americans tend to be, uh, seem to be more susceptible to uh, uh, COVID-19 than, than uh, non-African uh, Americans. As far as comorbidities, um, more patients were diabetic, uh, but really obesity, which has been identified in the literature as being a, one of the risk factors, doesn't seem to really have an effect. 
Um, more patients who survived were prone, 80% versus 62. And then we had a few more patients that were um, receiving either CRT or CVVH uh, in the non-survivor group. Experimental meds are, are used uh, quite frequently. Um, IL-6 antivirals are the uh, two primary, uh, IL-6 receptor blockers, excuse me, and antivirals are the two primary categories, although there are others as well. And then circuit chains outs, um, we're gonna talk about in a moment, the, uh, some of the risk factors associated with this, uh, didn't seem to really be different in those who either survived or didn't survive. Next slide. As far as the non-survivors, the 10, these were the cause of death that we were able to uh, ascertain. Um, and we're gonna circle back to the hypoxemia hypercarbia because that's something very unusual to see or, or not usual to see on ECMO. Uh, DIC, cerebral bleeding, um, hemorrhage is found in a number of patients and multi-system uh, organ failure. Um, with acute kidney injury was identified uh, with one as well. And respiratory failure, a generic categorization is shown in four patients. Uh, next slide. So in summarizing, um, what do we know? We see that uh, survivors tend to be more uh, female, likely to be female, um, and they're staying on ECMO longer. And of course, as mentioned, they are younger. Um, survivors may have, this is uh, something that seems to be trending in this direction, a higher use of proning and perhaps um, an earlier use of some of the experimental uh, medications that, uh, that have been um, uh, online and reported in literature. Uh, the complications, as Tom and Amy have, uh, have alluded to, um, are, are real hemodynamic instability. These patients are very volatile on ECMO. They're not stable and uh, they require a lot of uh, pressors to maintain them. Uh, coagulation disturbances, if anybody saw in the New England Journal of Medicine this morning, there was a release uh, out of China on uh, a paper that talked about some of the factors that may be affecting these coagulation disturbances. Um, and uh, they really feel that it's following a, an antiphospholipid type syndrome and, uh, and some, uh, some early data is supporting that. Uh, and these are, these are basically DIC. These are consumptive coagulopathies that we see with, uh, with different uh, phases, acute phase reactants such as fibrinogen tends to increase and decrease over time. Thrombocytopenia is real. And you know, perhaps this is associated with circuit failures, but the last item, the reduced extracorporeal gas exchange, um, this is something that's also been recently reported out of China. And it's thought to be due to specific receptor sites um, proteins that are on the coronavirus that result in an attacking of the heme molecule, uh, primarily peripherin, and this results in a failure for that uh, hemoglobin molecule to transport both oxygen and carbon dioxide. Again, very early data uh, just published, and it probably is something that's having an effect. So with that, I want to thank everybody um, for putting this panel together and for allowing us to present some uh, preliminary data. Thanks. Thanks, Al. Um, we have a lot of questions rolling in and um, Justin, you're going to start off with them. Sure, absolutely. Al, uh, Tom and Amy, thank you so much for your presentations. We'll uh, have Courtney chime in now for this uh, Q&A session. So we have a good 17 minutes, which I think is very important to kind of discuss the current trends because your head will spin as you uh, look at the ELSO discussions and the AMSEC discussions and the joint committee or joint uh, uh, task force discussion. So uh, it's good to have a, have a transparency here and, and talk about the current trends in COVID and ECMO support. Uh, with that said, my first question uh, to the group has to do with coagulation circuit thrombosis. I think this is a very uh, uh, a timely thing that people are concerned that they're going to be out of the room for these patients because they're not monitoring them as closely. And what are the current kind of trends that you're seeing or doing at your institution uh, to make sure that you're going to reduce the amount of thrombosis in circuit to stop, uh, to make sure you don't stop flow. Um, and I've heard, you know, uh, currently, you know, a lot of centers are choosing to go heparin free for VV ECMO, but now they're kind of following their VA ECMO protocol for, uh, for VV ECMO patients. But just to the panel, uh, what is your current uh, um, anticoagulation protocol for these patients that we're seeing that are hypercoagulable with high fibrinogen counts and platelet counts and D-dimers? Um, what is your strategy? Hey, everybody. Um, we are uh, 
out of Denver, Colorado. I work for specialty care and we've got four patients on to date, um, two still running. And as far as anticoagulation, that's been a big issue for us. I actually was really interested by Amy's um, chart, seeing how the three patients that she has been able to wean um, did not have heparinization issues, um, but the others that they did switch to bival are in fact still on ECMO. Um, I think that's just a fascinating thing to recognize. Um, our heparin is taking a long time to become therapeutic. I think that was brought up last week, um, and we're definitely seeing that a lot as well. So we are trying some DTIs, um, maybe some larger doses. Um, we haven't had a ton of circuit changeouts, but what's interesting is we will see the patient desatting um, slowly. So we'll do a post oxygenator gas and an ABG, um, and that ABG will look terrible. Um, even if our post oxy looks like it's satisfactory or 150 to 200. Um, so that comes into play with the, um, I don't know, maybe the O2 unloading or some of the dysfunctions we're seeing with the binding. Um, but for us, we are um, switching to DTI sooner. Um, if we're having issues, if our CRTs are going out quicker, um, and it is something that we're just dealing with day to day, trying to get more on top of this anticoagulation issue in the face of high coagulopathies, um, which we are seeing with our TIGs are very severe, so. Thank you, Courtney. Any other comments from the group about uh, coagulation changes uh, in your current practice? I, I can answer that. You know, a lot of our practices for um, for VV ECMOs, they don't routinely monitor I mean, they don't routinely anticoagulate. And one of the strategies was really to have that conversation to, you know, to, um, to facilitate some type of um, regimen, you know, so whether it's um, heparin or direct thrombin inhibitors. We will see anecdotally switching to direct, direct thrombin inhibitors have helped quite a bit in reducing um, some of the, some of the, I'm gonna say some of the coagulation issues, but it has helped in regards to not seeing as, drop, as low of a plate-like count decrease with that. Um, anecdotally is on the heparin, whether we have heparin or not, we've, we've seen a lot of the CRTs quad off and we haven't really seen that now since we switched to some like bivalve and all that, you start utilizing that strategy. As far as, um, you know, monitoring, what, a lot of our places or a lot of places don't monitor the pressures within the circuit. They keep it pretty simple, and especially with these patients, they want to keep it simple. We found that at least having the pre and post monitoring at least gives some guidances, some early detection. That way, if you start seeing changes in the delta P and correlate that with the patient gases, it, you at least can then begin the dialogue with the physician staff to what else is going on. And then you can look at um, any type of intervention that may be necessary. Thanks, Tom. A question also on uh, correlation that I got is a, a question about, uh, you know, it's great to hear that we're weaning some of these patients off of ECMO. Uh, as we saw from Al's report. My question is on, on anticoagulation and weaning, are you doing anything differently during that time period? Uh, any concerns on the wean process uh, for these patients? Um, yes, yeah, so I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so for patients that um, have been converted to bivalve, we are um, giving them a little bit of a heparin bolus during our weaning process. Um, and I think we've, we've had some, you know, I guess a fair amount of success with that. Um, our um, PTT goals are already on the higher end, so we're not really increasing those um, uh, for weaning per se. But um, yeah, just wanted to touch on the bivalve patients that we will end up uh, giving a little bit of heparin to. Um, we seem to have a few questions about um, proning the patient. So if you're taking a patient who's prone and flipping them, um, are you going straight for fem fem and, and just staying away from the neck and skipping a dual lumen Avalon? And do you prone them after they're on ECMO or do you find you don't need it anymore, Amy? So, um, so if our patients are prone before ECMO, we will flip them to cannulate them. Um, and then um, we have only done very limited proning um, on ECMO. I believe just two patients at this point. Um, and um, the perfusionists here, uh, we actually don't sit bedside, so I'm getting kind of that information from our uh, ECMO specialists, but they say they have a whole team of people to help flip those patients. Um, it's quite the uh, uh, labor-intensive um, and uh, resource-intensive process. Um, 
um, to, you know, get them into the prone position. I, I can't say whether or not they feel like it's really helped um, patients. I feel like if they were, they'd be doing it to more patients. Um, but it's definitely labor intensive for sure. Um, Courtney, are, are the staff members sitting bedside like they normally would the whole shift or are they trying to move out of the room for uh, and monitor from a distance? Yeah, so my team of four here um, is working around the clock and we are bedside. We don't go in the room unless we absolutely have to. Um, we sit outside the room, everything is facing the glass doors and we have worked through as a team and as a department and as a hospital um, kind of when we'll go in and do some post oxygenator checks um, or when the nurses need us to give them a hand with anything. But otherwise, I try to decrease the transmission as much, as much as possible um, for our whole team. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are doing that as well. So uh, it's a long game we're in and uh, staying as healthy as possible is super important. Uh Thanks, Courtney. My next question uh, will be about the exhaust port of our auctionators, whether that's polypropylene um, uh, fibers or PMP. And of course, there's a lot of question, a lot of uh, concern that we are introducing this virus into the environment from these sources, uh, especially when it is a plasma leak after six hours in light of the FDA approving a lot more of this technology to be used and utilized for ECMO. Uh, I uh, have seen some good reports that we're not seeing any of the virus come through, but theoretically it's possible if you look at the micron size of each. Um, but just want to uh, get your thoughts on what you're doing to make sure that you're protecting your team from uh, this uh, gas exhaust port and this potential uh, virus aerosoliz aerosolization. It's uh, interesting, this, this is Al. Um, the AABB has stated that the virus is not transmissible through any type of blood um, components. So um, the fact that they've come out and stated this on their website, um, it's, it's hard to imagine that it would end up in blood and that it would be a, a potentially sure. transmissible through an oxygenator. Be that as it sure. may, that does sure. not say we shouldn't protect ourselves. So to answer your question, sure. what we have done is we, uh, sure. we are asking everybody to run Bane circuits sure. on their exhaust ports in, in ECMO sure. and to vent them to the same uh, location that the ventilator exhaust is going to so that it's, uh, it's away from patients and of course um, uh, healthcare providers. Um, but, uh, but with the use of the current oxygenators, as Justin just said, um, and if we do transition to something that is more likely to plasma leakage, it probably is more important to go ahead and have those Bane circuits in place. I, I think our filming in a lot of ways is, is along what Al was saying, but with some of the manufacturers recently coming out and, and since they are taking the stance that they can't definitively guarantee that there's no transmission. I think we're just being more conservative and erring on the side of caution until you know more definitive studies come out or, or, or someone comes out and says that it, it definitely is not being transmitted for the TMP oxygeners. I think, um, I mean, we all know in regards to the hall of fiber, we see the size of the blood plasma very through. And so I think it's definitely um, prudent to have that conservative approach and scavenge you know, for any hall of fiber device or definitely within the OR setting. And, um, and it's common practice as it is for just routine bypasses to, to scavenge a gas outlet. So I think employing both measures in the effort of safety is, is it, you can't go wrong doing that. So it'd rather be wrong than, than you know, come and find out something later. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree early on, um, you know, we did talk about scavenging um, our ECMO circuits. Um, the decision was made um, by the um, intensivists up in the ICU um, not to scavenge. Um, they feel like at this point in time, all of our patients are in negative isolation, negative pressure isolation rooms. And so, um, and everyone's um, in N95 or PAPRs. So, um, but they said that we would continue to look at it. And, um, you know, should we start seeing or taking care of patients that um, aren't in those negative pressure rooms or we run out of them, we'd revisit that topic. Um, Steve Taylor um, wants to know from y'all, is anyone using beta blockers to reduce the native cardiac output to increase oxygenation? And there's been a couple questions about are people doing um, uh, transfusion, exchange transfusions to reduce um, 
uh, the viral load or anything they're doing, anything special you're doing with the blood? Not this time. It's an interesting That's concept. It's an interesting concept. I mean, it's, it's you know, plasma exchange is proven to be pretty effective in our pediatric population. We most often do it for, you know, for some of our um, antibody um, disorders, you know, related to heart, you know, heart surgery, heart transplants. And, um, but not in this populace that we tried it. And I, and I haven't seen any literature about it yet. I'd be interested to hear though. Treatment for antiphospholipid syndrome is plasma exchange. And if there is some credibility to the fact that the coagulopathies that we're seeing have similar modalities, then that would be called for. There's also a fair number of patients that are getting plasma convalescence which is really a plasma exchange, just not the same volume. So uh, the use of FFP may be shown to be beneficial in, in certain patients that, uh, that are developing or becoming hemorrhagic and develop these bleeding diathesis. So that's, that's one of the treatments as well as actually platelet inhibitors um, in, uh, in the, the realm of, uh, uh, of treatment for that uh, diverse coagulopathy. Thanks, so my next question uh, from the, the Q&A here has to do with, you know, what are we doing uh, to treat the existing blood uh, components that are CRRT, CVVH, Z-buffing, and uh, newly introduced and talked about, which is an old technology that is getting a little bit of um, play right now, is the cytokine absorbing hemofilters. Just want to talk about and pose this question to, the, uh, to this group is, is, are you using these ancillary techniques uh, for COVID patients on ECMO? Um, yeah, so we are, we're using um, the filter that we're using um, uh, is, it's the HF1000, and this is just what I'm told by the intensivists. I'm certainly no expert in this area, um, but they were just explaining that it removes um, cytokines via hemofiltration, um, as opposed to some of the other filters, which I guess they work through adsorption. Um, and with those filters, you have to uh, more frequently change them out um, or change out your CRT circuit. Um, so that's the rationale why they went with this, um, this specific filter here. I think that answered your question. We are not um, using any special filters for our CRT at the moment. Uh, however, we did lose our first COVID ECMO last night. Um, and I do believe he was um, our first and only at the moment who was experiencing potentially a cytokine storm. Um, from first initiation to the last day, it was vastly different from the rest of our COVID ECMO. So what's unique is everyone, like Al said, is presenting so differently. Um, so I think it'd be a great thing to look into these types of filters as we do encounter more patients who are experiencing a type of cytokine storm. because It's making it very difficult to keep them stable uh, and to wean them successfully. Right, we've got about two more minutes to make sure to stay on time. Renee, do you have one more question for the uh, the group? There's been a couple of questions on um, from Dimitri Thies. He wanted to know how you're disinfecting the circuit post COVID-19. There was another question about, is there anything we can do to disinfect like the inside of the machines? And another one um, from an anonymous attendee is, how are we, are you sequestering staff to minimize potential exposure? Because a lot of pediatric places Use two perfusionists, we're sitting side by side all day. Anybody doing anything to change that um, staffing look, appearance? Yeah, those, those are some challenges. And you know, it all depends on the, the dynamics within that particular hospital and, and the current makeup of, of the facility. And you know, a lot of the facilities, there's only two staff members, whether it's pediatrics or adults, depending on the size. So um, for the centers that, have both adult and perfusion and pediatric perfusion, you know, in house. Um, I know some approaches is trying to maintain that separation between the two and don't not to cross over. But you're starting to start seeing um, pediatric patients presenting with COVID positive that yet um, have progressed to acquiring ECMO support. So, I mean, this whole process is creating a lot of unique challenges that um, I think none of us have really come across before that. You know, it's going to require a lot out of the box thinking, and so it's, I know it's a very vague answer to not giving you an answer, but um, it there's challenges, and I think we all have to be creative, you know, with that, and you know, and also trying to be cognizant of staff burnout. So, 
And, and to answer your question in regards to addressing cleaning, you know, as, as this is progressing and we're learning a lot about it, about the progression, the, the dormancy of this, is we've kind of leaned a little bit on the firefighters and the paramedics. And what processes are they taking? Because, you know, they're the ones on the front line going to the, the patients' the houses and stuff and, and transporting to the, to the hospitals. And the sheer volume of patients they're exposed to, they really set a good example for us as practitioners to look at how are they actually maintaining, um, you know, disinfected other, uh, their equipment and all their supplies and anecdotally kind of meeting with various um, members of that, of that group. You know, they're, they're, some of the protocols they're, they're suggesting is looking at hydrogen peroxide, wiping down and letting it dry to seven to, to 10 minutes. Once dried, then going over with like a, a staining wipe or you know, some type of disinfected wipe to, um, to sterilize. But, um, that's something that we're looking into and started employing in some of our patients. So. Thank you, Tom. Uh, for the sake of time, I just want to say that, you know, I, I truly appreciate all the Q&A questions that are coming in. We've got more than 50, and we can, of course, uh, answer all of them. But please take these questions uh, to the joint uh, website, the Provision website. Uh, and uh, we appreciate all of your expertise and your knowledge and sharing. And thank you so much for your time. Renee, do you want to have any concluding statement? Um, I just want to say um, a big thank you to all the presenters. Thank you for taking the time. I know you guys are super busy. Your, the information has been so helpful. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to Smith Buckland, and especially Kate Maud, um, who's helped us put all these webinars together in such a huge, quick fashion. Um, we couldn't put, it, put these together without her help. Um, and I also hope everyone who celebrated Passover last night on Zoom had a good Passover cedar. And um, for everybody celebrating Easter, happy Easter. Happy Zoom Easter. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This webinar will be on, on the website. It is also live streamed by perfusion.com uh, on YouTube. And uh, stay tuned for the next installment next week for webinar number three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.